Joining us on today's Performance People are a husband and wife business power couple. George Bamford is the owner and founder of Bamford Watch Department, on the board at JCB and part of a great British business family. Alongside him is his wife, Leo, who founded and runs My Baba. That's a website which guides parents through pregnancy and parenthood. These two performance people are forging their own entrepreneurial paths. I was born into the lottery. I was very lucky. There isn't that kind of thing of like, hey, you know, I'm going to fill my father's f footsteps. I walk alongside, I walk behind, but I'm never going to be filling those feet. I always say to George, don't look back, darling. You're not going that way. OK, so just to establish where everybody is, <clears> because we do look like we're all in disparate parts of the world. Leonora, you're at home in the countryside, um, manning a very small puppy. And, um, and being in charge of that. While George is in London in, I guess, your Mayfair townhouse. Is that right, No, George? I'm not, actually. I'm, I'm at home in London. Um, oh. Because we had, I had a few early morning uh, meetings this morning. So I, I've just carried on. I, okay. I, I couldn't get to the office in time. So not in this the is, office this yet. Is, this is my kind of office in, at home, so... It looks That's much, got much stuff slicker than me. Ben's office in Barcelona, which is all about <laughs> No, his, his, his is yeah, what I want to be in. I mean, like, look how slick that, that's, that's the purest mind. You, if you see my office, it's a, it's a mess. I mean, like, I live in a mess. It's perfect. I don't know. I've got a bit of work to do with this office. That's for sure. <laughs> I've just banned, I've just banned, I don't know, Leonora, I don't know if you struggle with this. I've just banned children's toys from the kitchen, which I feel is a really unfair oh, thing God. to do. But I've had enough, I've absolutely had enough of the mess that it creates around the edges. And I'm like, nope, you, you're out of here. So as the school sort of holidays wind up and we're back to school again, I'm like, right, the kitchen begum, becomes my domain again. I don't know if you, you, well, you're looking after a new puppy at the minute, so you'll know about squalor and yeah, mess, I've no doubt. I've got a lot of puppy paraphernalia in the kitchen, but I spend my life, I'm a, an avid tidier, which drives George mad. Really? And I'm constantly moving papers from one side of the kitchen to the other, thinking I'm making it tidier. Probably have to about 10 times a day. And the kids have one step each where all their crap goes on the step <laughs> and then they can take it upstairs. I like the idea of that one step each. That's kind of cool. I do like the idea of that. Um, yeah. So you two, how do you manage? How do you manage this perpetual juggle of family life and, and business life and everything that comes with it? You've both got growing businesses, both got a growing family together, just got a new puppy. I mean, how do you make it all work? Leonora, perhaps you you go first. <laughs> I think we just take each day as it comes, really. I know I love that question. People always ask about the, the home business balance. We have definitely not got it right yet. Um, we spend holidays chatting about what right would look like. Um, but inevitably, we just try and take each day as it comes. And you have good weeks and you have get bad weeks. We've got, I think, a few good weeks coming up. Lots of change at the moment. But... Um, no, it's exciting. I think just keep your cool and know that tomorrow is a brand new day. And George, how about you? Yeah, I, uh, well, look, the thing is, I, I, I'm sure you go through the same. Every year you go, oh, you know, we're going to do it differently next year. I'm going to be at home more or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Um, each time you go, yeah, but this is coming up or this is coming <laughs> up. And, and it just, I, I think that's life. I think it's kind of... Um, you know, I'm very, very lucky, and uh, I think we're both, uh, Ben and I are very lucky, is to have, um, you know, a powerhouse behind and together with us. You know, that's the great thing, is that it is on both sides of us. You know, my life wouldn't wouldn't work, and Leo's life wouldn't work if we weren't together. We, we're at this kind of equal thing of saying, yeah, you go and do that. I And that's the great thing, is working together to make it hopefully work. But it is that thing of the absence is kind of like, I, you know, during the week, I, I hate being at home during the week. I, I, I'm not at home in, with my wife in the week. I'm, I'm, I'm here in London working and, and it's, it's one of those things, but then it makes the weekend so precious and so wonderful and so magical. And then, then you go, oh my God, I want to be back and doing this, you know, and I want to be staying, working from home during the week. And, but it doesn't work. You, you always find something where you have to get back and you have to do this and you have to do that. So I, I, the work-life balance um, is probably out of balance is probably the best way of describing <laughs> it at the moment. 
We talk as well about being sort of present. You know, like if you're going to be away during the week or you're busy during the week, which Ben is as well, because he's in Barcelona during the week and I'm in London. And that that's fine. But when you get back together again, it's that kind of bit where you've just got to sort of put your phones to one side and just get on with being sort of cram into that sort of 24 to 36 hour period, like being a family that most people probably cover in the space of a week, but you end up having to fast track it, don't you, into a two day period. Are there any things that you're both terrible at that you, you just feel like you've really got to improve at on that, on that side? The phone is the worst thing ever. <laughs> It's, I, I, I love when you say put the phone down. We every every New Year's resolution we're going to have, we're going to learn a language, and we're gonna we're going to put our phones away. And at um, five o'clock, at you five even o'clock. bought those Nokia banana phones. Do you remember one year, yeah. so that we could just if we needed to text someone at night, it would take about fifteen minutes, so you just wouldn't bother. <laughs> that didn't work, did it? No, but do you know? Good I idea. think George, you always say that. My big battle is saying, come on, we've got to put the phone down. There's something always more important. But I I promise myself every day I'm going to do that. And actually, our son, our eldest, is a teenager now. And last night he came in, it's funny, he's always the latest one to bed. Came in at 11 o'clock last night and he was trying to chat to me. And I was answering some absurd message on Instagram someone who is just you know this could wait this could wait and George always says I'm so impulsive I have to be on constant reply but my son just said to me mum remember you're not meant to be doing this stuff at 11 o'clock at night I'm trying to ask you something and you know you weigh up what's more important chatting with my son or answering some ridiculous message that you just don't need to so I think it is a real devil on your shoulder this phone and special social social media and I think um, taking a break, as Instagram say, they're trying to push everyone to do super important. And who who pushes the hardest out of the both of you to take that time out? You know, at the weekends or on holidays to put the phones down. <laughs> Who's leading the charge? She's sitting. <laughs> George can't put his phone down. He's completely addicted. You know, you have that thing where it says how many times you pick it up. I mean, if you looked at it now, darling, it's probably about three hundred and twenty from this morning. <laughs> But I've got to say, though, when you talk about presence, when George is home, he really does. You know, if he's climbing with my daughter, he's focused, he's climbing. If he's going on an adventure, a bike ride, he is super present and he's a very hands-on dad when he's there. Thanks. Thanks. George, what have you... What I have feel you... like there's, there's a sting in that tale of like, oh, yeah, no, he's, if, if he's there... No, it's but he, like... when you're there, when you're there... George, you've also yeah. grown up. You've so. grown up with two incredibly entrepreneurial parents, both of them. So, oh, what yeah. have you? What have you learned from the? You know, that, has that just always been ingrained in you in life because you've grown up and it's a? It's almost like osmosis. You're just going to pick up on that because of the world in which you've occupied forever. Yeah. So, my uh, what's the best way of describing it? Um, we have a family motto and it's it's one of the worst mottos in the world is uh jamais content is never content um so it's every morning getting up and and going back out and doing it again um so for me that is always the thing that um you know i've i've got two amazing inspirational um parents you know that have gone out and done something they've they you know the honest thing, my mother could have sat, sat back and done nothing. My father probably could have done roughly the same. And both of them have gone out and, and, and lived life to the maximum. And, and in the sense of actually, hey, I've done this, I'm doing this. Um, and, you know, that was when, when I, um, you know, I, I thought, great, I'm going to go into the family business. I'm going to be this. And my father said, no, you're not. You're going to go and learn the value of a pound and go and do something on your own. Um, and it was probably the toughest kind of uh, reality check for me, but it was actually one of those good things. He, they always said, you know, and th- there's always this thing, you know, Ben, I'm, you are, well, both both of you are these people that seize the day, you know, that actually go and enjoy every minute of the day. And my parents were exactly the same. If we were lying in bed in the morning, it was like, no, here's, you know, my father did it to my son recently. My son said, 
do you really, is this is, we were staying with my parents and basically my father pulled open the curtains and said <laughs> up and my son was just like, but I'm sleeping. And I was just like, okay, the reality check is kind of like, that's how my father was. It was always, or, you know, I, I, if ever I'm on holiday, he goes, are you still on holiday? Um, and, and it's like the day one in holiday. So it's always that thing of like, and I work for myself. So it is, there's a drive there. Um, and I don't know how I can in, impart that drive into my own children, um, or if I have or not, but it is, it is that thing of like, you see from their, their feet and, you know, I'm, I'm, I, it's been a very great thing because I've, I haven't gone into the family business, um, until recently. And it's been an amazing thing to be in that. What about the pressure of the family name? Because it's always something that, you know, it's just who you are. But does it come with, was there ever a moment in your life, especially looking at your son, who's now like a teenager, the pressure of the family name of living up to a particular type of expectation because of what's been achieved already? Did you ever feel that? I, I'm very lucky. I'm the third son or the third <laughs> child. So I'm, I'm kind of like, I, 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 but also I did my own thing. You know, the, 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 the most bizarre thing, or my father says it kind of uh, was amazing. We were in Japan and, and uh, there was something. And my father said um, he went into a watch shop in Japan and he brought a watch. And I said, oh, Bamford, are, are you the father of George? <laughs> and so that, that then meant, you know, and I always think that's kind of one of those charming things that makes me go, actually... You know, I, 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 I'm known as George. I'm known as, you know, and I've, 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 I've carved out my own little niche. It's not a big family business. It is my own little niche. So I, I've, I've been very hell bent on kind of just doing what I do. You know, and I think that's kind of the great thing. Family business, always, there is that there, but is the pressure... I I don't know. I, I I maybe maybe there is maybe there isn't. But there isn't that kind of thing of like, hey, you know, I'm going to fill my father's f footsteps. I've always said I will never. I I I walk alongside. I walk behind. But I'm never going to be filling those feet. Because... It's really really interesting, isn't it? Because people often talk about when you have successful parents that it's very hard for the children to to really grow out of, from under that shadow. I guess a question for for Lee and Nora. How how do you see that? Because clearly George has has done brilliant things with with his own on on his own. Touch wood. And 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 but also has that drive. And yeah, that he does the drive. Um, I think George has mass motivation. I think that's what drives him. He gets up in the morning, and no matter what, when his feet hit the floor, he says, this is going to be a great day. And if he hears me sigh and be like, oh, I've had a terrible night's sleep, he's like, come on, let's change the narrative, let's get up, let's get cracking. He's excited by every day. Um, and I think the the family name i'm i'm not sure i think you like you say you always look forward we have inspirational parents to look to and advise and they always help us along the way but i always say to george don't look back darling you're not going that way you know he's got his path and he's always looking forward never back that's a really interesting take that isn't it because you're you're no because you're gonna put you're gonna like you say you're gonna pull on the advice of those around you who have been able to achieve these great things but like you say you have to if you're going to be entrepreneurial it's got to be it's got to come from you hasn't it and certainly but well, both of you have done that i mean leonora how important is it for you as well to do your own thing um it wasn't when we got married i was very happy to be um, sort of just chilling around, not, you know, not having anything massive on my own. And very quickly, I was in corporate finance, which George used to find very boring. And he said, what is it that lights your fire? Come on, you've got to, you've got to have that spark, go for it. And, and I did. And my God, I'm so happy. I couldn't imagine life without my business. As you said, you know, the, the work-life balance is always a challenge, but I get up every morning and I love it. I love the sector I'm in the people that I meet. Um, and I think both of us are entrepreneurs in our own way, same with our parents. Um, and I think that does filter down. Um, I think it goes part and parcel with sort of neurodiverse people, which George and I 
both are, and we've sort of given that wonderful gift to our children as well. Um, but I mean, my son is obsessed with um, with <laughs> making businesses out of nothing, isn't he, George? Like even in lockdown, age sort of eleven, he was making a business on Instagram selling organic tracksuit bottoms with patches on, <laughs> sending them all over the world. Or I was sending them all over the world. He was patching them up. <laughs> Just to explain that neurodiversity thing as well, for people who are listening that aren't familiar with it, just, just tell us a bit more about that, because that's interesting. So I'm 41, George is 42, and both of us were diagnosed super early with dyslexia. And in those days, it wasn't really a huge thing. You know, your parents would know if it, you know, you're struggling with things that other children were finding easy at the time. And so we were, in essence, sort of guinea pigs for those coloured overlays and funny glasses <laughs> and tongue twisters. Um, and when we got together, we used to joke, we were like, there's no way we can have children because they'd be absolutely buggered. <laughs> um, and we did. But actually, the first two are seriously dyslexic. And there's not a new thing, but there's a similar thing for maths called dyscalculia. Um, and both of our elder two have that as well. So school is not the easiest, um, yet the creativity side, the sport, everything else, the drama they are excelling at, but the maths and English, they really struggle. Um, but I think that on the flip side, it's a wonderful gift because it, you're a critical thinker, think outside the box. And when we arrive somewhere, George, you've got it sussed within five minutes, and I think... Our older two are exactly the same. You know, you know where you are, what you're doing, how to get out from a very early age. I don't know what you think, Di. Yeah, I, I look, I, 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 I think you described it very well. I think in 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 society, probably we shouldn't have uh, been together because uh, or had had children. It's kind of one of those things where you look at it and you think, poor them. But honestly, the, it is amazing to see how, um, you know, we all find ways of dealing with the world, dealing with everything coming towards us and thinking in different ways. And, you know, watching it through my son's eyes, I mean, um, uh, during lockdown, I, I started, um, we built a car together and we did some other things. And it was very much doing uh, things instead of looking on the internet you know we built this wonderful little uh, beach buggy thing and putting the engine in and doing all those things but it was amazing to see him come alive and understanding in that way of like the doing side not the not the educational side and I think in you know that's how I grew up I you know how I got into the watch world how I did all of these things was by doing I mean you know 1995 I I took a, a, my parents gave me for Christmas um, a uh, a beautiful watch for 300 quid and and um, uh, I took it to bits and uh, and um, on Boxing Day it was on on my bed uh, on a um, a towel every little piece was there and I'd done it with a glass, a screwdriver and a pen, a pen knife. It was one of those things where I I could never, you know, I couldn't have read about it. I couldn't have, you know, I just uh, understand by doing. And I think that's how we've hopefully trying to teach our children is about doing. I think sport has been one of the best things. Uh, I've been seeing my son grow in sports. Um, you know, he's a rugby guy he he plays for the the local teams uh not at school but actually local um uh county teams and you know that for me is what been one of those things that's given him confidence um and i think in our side uh, business has, has given me the confidence to do more um uh because it's saying actually people are liking what i'm doing and i think the same with leo you know we both kind of had more confidence of what we'd been doing because, you know, that doing and that understanding and people going, oh, my God, I like that because of this. Or, you know, for me, if, if we get a sellout of something or we do something, you know, you kind of go, oh, my God, that's so cool. Or, uh, you know, the most bizarre thing I uh, last summer, we we did a, uh, a launch with G-Shock. It was, it was unreal. But there were people queuing around the block. And I was like, this is n and it wasn't the boost of that side of, of my ego. It was more people like what I'm doing, you mm. know, and that was the coolest, the coolest thing. And, and that gave me the kind of go, go again, let's go again, let's do it again. And, 
I'm sure, Ben, you feel the same when you're kind of like, hey, I'm going to go and do it again. You're like, you know, I'm sure people are like, oh, you're really doing it again? And then you're just like, yeah, I'm going to do it again. And and it's that kind of like going back at the, the grindstone again. Well, it's very true, though, isn't it? What you're saying, whether it's in business or in sport, you've got to be passionate about yeah. what you're doing. So that that's where that, that drive comes from. Going back to the sport as well, just in a little bit on neurodiversity, is they often say if you're dyslexic, you're not usually amazed. They, sometimes it goes hand in hand with sport. Oh, I can't catch times. a ball. Exactly. But I've got to say, practice does make perfect. And I know, you, Ben, you probably agree. I'm reading for my son at the moment. He's listening on audio, and I'm listening to, to The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle um, for school. And it's all about talent. And you're not always born with talent you can really nurture talent if you you know if you want to play golf and you do 10,000 swings a day you're going to be pretty talented by the end of the year um so I think just keep going at it is a really good message for children especially if they've got that spark and that ignite for something that's such a good message Leonora I I couldn't agree more that there are a lot of talented people in in this world but really what makes a difference is how how hard you're willing to to work for it absolutely George, when you, what, where was that moment? Was there a specific moment where, like you say, you're sort of you're 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 tinkering around and you're doing what you're doing and you're you know you're not playing a thing, but you're sort of experimenting. Was there a moment where you thought there's a business in this? And what what was that moment which led you to create Bamford Watch Department because you knew that what you were doing with your experimental side could actually become something you know tangible in a business? So if you notice behind me, it's photography books. Um, I was a photographer. I went to Parsons in New York and I studied photography. My hobby business, my hobby side was I used to go to flea markets and trade watches. And um, uh, my business has been going uh, this year. We celebrate 20 years of my business. So that's kind of uh, that's me showing my age a little bit. I started very young. Um, I was very lucky. I I kind of um, and this is where I'd say to you, you came back to the parents idea. I I was born into the lottery. I was very lucky, um, you know, and that's one of the things. But I was very lucky. um, There was. Um, My mother had a a business called Bamford & Sons and um, she basically gave me a counter to trade watches Um, and that's how my and I I started in a shared office Um, but what happened was I came back as a photographer to the UK I thought God owes me a living I'm going to be the super photographer I'm going to be charging this and I had some really good jobs I worked for Vanity Fair I worked for um, uh, Jaguar I worked for some really great projects and some really great shoots but um, when the recession hit I couldn't charge my prices were meant to go up and they went down and my watch business was making money and so I was like well and it was an obvious like you've got to go over here and but it was tough so at the time. It was it was the tough decision, and you know, I think in life there's those tough decisions. You're saying goodbye to creativity in that sense, and I and you know now I'm creativity on design, and uh, you know working with the brands I do, it's amazing because they're saying yeah, let's go and do more, let's go and go and be more creative with you and have some fun. But at the time, it was a, it was a very much, you know, jumping off that precipice and going, what the hell am I doing? So that's an, in, that's an interesting point you make because there'll be a ton of creative people out there that try their hand of lots of different things. And it's sort of knowing where to turn and where to twist and where to stick and where not to. And how did you sort of, what, did you, I mean, is it as simple as writing a pros and cons list? I mean, how do you make those ultimate decisions that take you in a different direction? Do, do you know, I, I, I asked my father this and it was quite an interesting thing. I said, um, uh, you know, I, I want to create a five year business plan. He said, I've never done that. <laughs> uh, and I was just like, OK, um, so the thing is, I think it's about doing doing something that makes you feel, you know, gut wise. You know, if if you're starting to make something and saying, actually, this is me, you risk a lot. You know, you risk time, you r- risk money, but you also risk, you know, 
healthy risk you know there's been so many kind of wonderful things in life ben you are the kind of epitome of this about risk you know you think you do a risk assessment but then you actually go out there and do it and you're like going christ that risk assessment didn't work you know (laughs) that's kind of one of those things where you kind of try and mitigate risk but the thing is you can't you can't mitigate risk in this way of kind of you've got to do you've got to go and do the thing and go and and walk the walk you know i and you know leo said it but i always say i'm sitting right here opposite you three people on my screen and i've got no kind of view behind me of anything i regret because it's taken me to this point right now that i'm sitting opposite you three and that for me is where if there was anything that was wrong you know if there was a you know if i wrote a a a book about um business I, I probably would look at everything and go, God, that took me to this point. But at the mo- when I was going through it, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to be sitting here today. I, I, I was like, I didn't know. It was like, I, is the business going to be over tomorrow? I mean, even during COVID, I was like, Jesus Christ, are we going to are we going to be able to pay our employees? Are we going to be? I mean, you know, I took the watchmakers benches out of our office and delivered them to their homes because I was like, we've still got to make money. So, you know, that's where you kind of go, is it one of those things where you go, uh, you know, did I analyze anything? I didn't. It was a needs must. That's an amazing mindset because I I certainly look back and I think of all the mistakes I've made and (laughs) constantly kick myself in the the backside for it. What? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, no. Like the fear of failure, George, with a sport, with an athlete, living with an athlete, the the fear of failure. And in my previous career as a sports broadcaster, every successful athlete I ever interviewed, the fear of failure is more of a driving force than the desire to win. Mm. It's a very bizarre headspace that this person operates in. (laughs) But maybe that slight difference between, you know, the entrepreneur and... You know, sports, sports right? quite different, isn't it? Because it's very black and white. Mm. You either win or you don't. Uh, building true. a business, there are different, you know, variations of success, aren't there? And it, and it may take 10, 20 years, um, but you've got that time to build it out. Mm. George, you always say, one of your sayings, risk it for a chocolate biscuit, but you always say, fail fast. You're always just on to the next thing. You're like, if it fails, don't worry, just get up, get on to the next one, keep going, keep it rolling. So you're never scared of failing, are you? You're just like, let's let's do this. I've had quite a few failures, <laughs> so yes. Um, but, you know, that's taken, that that's given me the learning point to, you know, I, and I think that's where you look at people's scars or anything in their life. You know, you start as this wonderful, beautiful little baby and then life kind of adds their own little marks on you. And those things are whatever it is, it could be a welding mark when I, you know, learnt to weld at kind of a young age and, you know, I've still got a thing on my hand. But I but it was one of those great experiences that got me to kind of understand how to weld or or, you know, something where we go, oh, you know, this happened when this happened. You know, those things are life's little marks that, you know, when they kind of do the Benjamin Button, the life in reverse. You know, we always go, oh, my God, if our, if our life was in reverse, we would we would do these things differently. I, I kind of think, well, yeah, but that's why we've got all these scars. That's why you've got all these things. It's the experiences that's taken you to understand where you are. You know, you think about what you're doing, Ben. You know, you're being in Spain. You're 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 pushing hard again. And, you know, you're going and going, you know, but you've got more experience than anyone else, I'm sure around you at the moment because you've gone I've done this I know this you know and that's what I love I, lo- I love those little um little yeah. scars of life been, even been if they're internal it, been, been going at it long enough now that yeah I am I am <laughs> becoming one of the more experienced people in the America's Cup game but uh, <laughs> no like you say you what you know the success is all the losses you learn from all of them don't you and the, the important thing is to is to analyze that and figure out how you can how you can be better moving forward on that point though just coming back to jcb uh jcb um very um very kindly supported us with the cup team with 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 different um components and 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 machinery and and so on for getting the boats in and out of the water and and the maintenance and i've been up to the site in staffordshire to the academy and i was just wondering from what you've learned 
you know, going on your, out on your own in business, if you came back to JCB, you know, what changes would you make? And when you look at the academy, surely oh, that's a great thing in the future of, of that business. Um, so being on my own, what was really nice was what my father said to me, why, why go on your own? Um, and he said, well, firstly, there's no travel department, there's no legal department, there's no, you're, you're your own travel officer, you're your own legal department, you're your own accounts department, you are, you know, and look, the, the great thing about JCB is it is something that my father and my grandfather have built. Um, I look at it um, and the biggest problem is I see, I, I always say I, I sit on a, um, you know, fish tank. So you've got the outside where you see the most beautiful fish and then you see the inside and you go, oh, you know, do, uh, you know, it needs a bit of a clean or it needs this. I sit on the edge of both of them. I, I, I'm, I, I am literally the biggest cheerleader for anything to do with JCB. I mean, in my, you know, it has been one of those things. Um, but it also is, is, you know, what my father has done, the academy I love. Uh, he has done this thing about getting uh, people back to, um, uh, you know, more people into the workplace, the Staffordshire rebuild. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that he does do around um, Utoxeter, um and Roaster. Um, and there's things that you you don't realise and then you go, oh my God, he's done that. But the same in India. You know, we go to India um, and we're manufacturing in India and you, you see you know the academies there you see the um the community that has been built in india um it is absolutely amazing so i i there's you know i can't say oh i'd change this or i'd change that i mean how could i do that from my my little pulpit versus this kind of big big business there's no way you could change anything because it is in such an amazing way maybe i would say i want more people to more more people to come from the academy and not go to other companies i would want them to come there because i i, I think that would be amazing um but also probably more people from the uk to travel to our other other places that's the only thing i'd probably really try and get is people to understand the world you know um because you you can be myopic um in um, being in, in one place and you know you can talk about any business you know the headquarters is their headquarters but you want people to travel you know we've got places we've got a manufacturing in Brazil manufacturing in America manufacturing in India we've got manufacturing in China um, but we've also got um, uh, offices around the world this is something that you know if I was at that business and I was starting young I would want to be going and and working in India, working here, where, you know, I'd be wanting to go and work around the world because I think that, you know, as I talk to you about these little scars on your hands or your, you want to know, you want to know different people, you want to know different attitudes, different vibes, different, you want to experience the world. You know, there's places that my wife wants to go to, there's places I want to go in the world that I want to go and, f you know, even down to lockdown, I was searching places and I was going, oh my God, you know, I want to go to um, a place in Ethiopia that's got these wonderful church. You know, I want to go and see the world. And I think that's where working for a business like JCB, I want, I, I would love more people to want to work in other places. And, and I don't see as much as that. That's my probably the only change. And, and do you think to that point, do you think the culture is set from the top isn't it really from your grandfather and your father in the UK and and that is important isn't it spreading that culture now it's a global business there is uh, uh, there is that jamais content written on the wall uh, when you go around JCB so uh, you know what I'd say to you is um, and it's not it's it's translated as never content but it's really finding a better way um, and you know there is it's a family business um, and it thinks the great thing, and I think this is where what, Georgie, you were talking about sportsmen versus businessmen, and I don't think there is a divide because I think you're, you're going out every day and doing something, but I think that is this whole thing about 10, 15, 20 years time planning is the difference. If you're out there and you're, you're you know, I, I think five years, 10 years, um, and as a family business, my father thinks 20 years. If he's going to build something, he goes, yeah, but that's 20 years. You know, we, we're, we're looking long term. 
So I think that's a difference. I think that's... Um... Also, I guess the other thing is, is we all grow up. So over time, yeah. you know, these scars happen. Um, you know, life happens, things get in the way um, and you have to sort of navigate different paths as they emerge. And, and we just sort of grow up, don't we? So our mind is much broader and far less narrow as we get older to sort of take, take that, those learnings into different situations. Leo, where you're concerned with um, my Baba and the podcasts that have followed and everything else, normally when you're setting up a company, we're, we're setting up a startup at the minute. Um, there, it always sort of comes from this idea of a problem to a solution, right? You've got a problem that you need to solve. Well, there's probably a ton of other people out there who feel exactly the same way. Now, when I look on your website, I think I wish I'd discovered you earlier because you are like this absolute oracle and this great source of information and in, in a completely non-patronizing fashion, which I think is so important for mums to be, mothers that are, you know, expectant, mums, fathers, whatever. So ju just tell me about sort of, you know, what led you to that path based on the fact that if we're, if we're thinking in, in line of problem equals solution, is that where this came from? Yeah, it did actually. And actually it was George's problem at the time because we got together quite early. Um, I was 22, we got married, we started a family and I used to spend a lot of evenings answering emails or texts from people asking questions about what do you do for a pram do you breastfeed what happens if there's a problem with this or that so I used to write these long lengthy replies and George would say for Christ's sake just put it on a blog and tell them to look at that <laughs> so it started as a very very simple daily blog just answering those questions and helping people and I think I was very very lucky with the timing and it really took off within, like, I think even the first 12 months. I mean, there weren't many blogs in those those days. You know, it, I think it was maybe 12 I feel 12 like we need a Zimmer frame. <laughs> no, but it was 12 or 13 years ago, so it was different. I mean, now there are, you know, millions and millions of mum and dad blogs, and it's amazing. But I just wanted to cut through the mass of crap really out there when you were looking on Google and saying, you know, what are the rules on car seats or what happens if this or that? And so I put it on a blog and now we've got hundreds of expert writers. I'm super lucky um, to be working with the top of the top. So I don't profess to be an expert on parenting, but I definitely have the experts behind me. And really, it's built around them, not me. George, you always say that, surround, surround yourself in business with people who are better than you. And mm. I definitely do that. Um, and so it wouldn't work without the amazing team I've got. Um, but I would hope that if you go on our website, you can see anything from, um, you know, um, morning sickness or pre-pregnancy or if you're having struggles with IVF all the way up to sort of tween skincare is one of our biggest hitters or fashion for mums. It's everything in between. Um, but I hope as well, a little bit lighthearted and a bit fun to, to read. I'm definitely going to be getting on there. <laughs> no, I'm, it's I'm a definitely bit late, going to be darling, on but never mind. <laughs> There's lots for lots for no, men. No, on well, there. you know, fashion sense and so on, and skincare. I mean, I, pardon the pun, but I'm all at sea. Whenever I get left, we've, we've got a, a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. When I get left, I'm I'm in trouble. So oh. I'll, I'll be on there looking for some tips. What you do in daddy daycare? There's an article right there. Oh, how to, how oh, to do daddy daycare do, properly without sort of you know. Ending well, there's up in always hospital. a scar there, isn't there, Georgie? <laughs> Thank you very much. I knew you'd bring that up. Daddy daycare. I took my son, my our six year old, off cycling, and he keeps on, and he's got a scar, a little <laughs> kind of rash scar where he fell off the bicycle, and came back, and it was not, it was, uh, you know, I know it was, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't your fault, fault darling. <laughs> it definitely wasn't my fault, but he came back. It was, you know, and and anyway, for the whole of the summer, he kept on going, even to my parents. That was daddy, daddy daycare, daycare. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my goodness. So it's kind of, uh, but at. Joking apart, there is a lot on there for um, for dads. I just interviewed a great guy called the Dad Lab who actually ch finished his business and started um, a YouTube channel for science experiments at home for kids. And he's got millions and millions of followers, but he's very, very cool to follow. And there are some really fun things to do on there. Leo, we started this podcast by talking about how important it was not to blow the kitchen up with kids' toys all over the place, and now you're encouraging it? This is not helpful in the slightest? You can do it in the garden. I was going to ask if you had any tips for, for dads with foul language that 
<laughs> oh gosh, we are swear, really swear bad. Down, anything other than a swear jar. Well, George and I have terrible, terrible language. And I've got to say, when they come back from school, I know what's happening here. Um, when they come back from school and they've been told off saying the F word, you try and curb <laughs> your <laughs> your language. Uh, basically, I have loads of um, loads of business cards um, and some of them cannot be shown on this, but because uh, I'm sure this is a nice uh, thing, but I have and they are all loads of swear words. This is the only one that is a little bit more easy. Um, but you can see that. Um, <laughs> so how can I go to my kids and say, you can't say that if I've got a business card that they yeah, can then you, give you've me? Got a, you've got so, a podcast with a swear word in it. That's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and it's kind of it's it's one of those things. You know, I, I, I did these because I was always thinking about, you know, how do you remember someone? um afterwards uh you know and i wanted to and in japan everyone gives business cards so i wanted to actually do it so like you know it's that kind of thing of like <laughs> yes about everything I like so anyway it. That, that was my kind of uh little trick um, I like- but yes uh how do you deal with with kids and swear swearing um try not to laugh Try not to laugh and then and try not to make it into that way. Um, ben, the only thing, my only claim to fame on, on Leo's website is I wrote what to take to a hospital um, <laughs> when well. your wife uh, is giving birth. That was the only claim to fame. And I'm sure she's taken it down <laughs> no, uh, recently. Darling, sure. But that was my only thing I wrote that was the only advice. Everything else, really, it's kind of, um, I keep on going back to that Baz Luhrmann thing is the only advice is sun cream sun uh, suntan cream everything else is kind of me my own meandering voice no that's a that's a solid contribution <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know leo this is the thing about um the you know when you think about when you set that website up and and sort of the the world and what's happened since and what we've lived through uh with the covid pandemic and everything else um people taking their health more seriously now more than ever i mean i someone mentioned to me the other day um that there is a whole generation of people of which i think we probably fit in we're a little bit older than you two but not by too much and it's it's described as the worried well and the worried well group of people that sort of come off the back of this covid pandemic people of our age group who suddenly think oh god am i okay am i going to be okay you know and start panicking about the smallest of things and obviously it's important to get checked about everything and anything but it's it's this sort of notion that there's this low grade stress i mean have you guys ever sort of felt that that sort of low grade anxiety um, that sort of lives with you in terms of your health and wellness I think, George, you're quite an anxious person. Um, Yeah. And I think COVID definitely did. I hate talking about COVID because it's so boring, but I definitely think a lot of children suffer from mass anxiety um, and separation issues after that. And I just think time's the greatest healer when it comes to anything. Um, So I think that hopefully will pass. Um, I... I Ben, you you may well you you feel this probably um, or or don't realise you're feeling it. You, you probably do. Um, this year, I could say to you, I I maybe worried. Well, it was probably where, uh, worried, but also kind of in a funk. Um, and I did a launch of a watch, um, and I went racing. Um, I, I went in the desert racing, um, and in a beach buggy basically, um, in Mexico. Um, and it uh, it was one of those things that was it was life affirming uh, in the sense of um, almost dying uh, in the sense of like being on a cliff face. And, you know, there's a few things that were kind of the risk it for a chocolate biscuit scenario. Um, but what I would say to you is it made me kind of face face a few things. And I came back and I was like, actually, life is good. Life is, you know, and whatever the case is, even if you've got a down, there's going to be an up day. But when I was in Mexico, it was one of those things where, you know, it was uh, a friend of ours um, uh, did a, a, a jump. And this was a thousand miles throughout desert uh, off roading in, in uh, it was called the Nora 1000. And, you know, there's 500 participants and it was a lot of things. And a friend of ours was in a motorbike and he fell off his motorbike uh, and 20. He woke up 20 steps away from his bike. 
and his bike was crushed and we rebuilt his bike that night and it was one of those things that made me go actually whatever the case is you know go and enjoy whatever is in front of you go and you know see the sunrise see the you know i i i i walk back from work um and sometimes i pop into the brompton oratory and i sit there and i just go this is beautiful and it doesn't matter if you're religious or not. It's that just appreciation for something. And, you know, the appreciation of just sitting there and breathing and going, hey, this is cool. So, Ben, I'm sure sometimes you're you're in that place where you're like going, beep, 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 beep. This is going to be. But it's that appreciation for the sunrise or the sunset or the whatever it is, is is that life affirming. I, I you know, an accident happens or a, a emergency happens. There's a reason why it's called an emergency. And this is one of my realization. Uh, but it's how do you deal with the emergency afterwards? How do you deal with the recovery? Um, and I, I, this was kind of midway. I, I, I did a bit of a cycle ride and I did... Um, Land's End to John O'Groats, and I was up at the um, up in the top of Scotland. We'd we'd had a bit of an emergency situation during COVID, and um, I, I arrived up in Scotland, and I and I, it was the first time I realised I was just like, yeah, it's how did you deal with the recovery versus the emergency? The emergency, I felt emasculated. I felt in this place where I couldn't do. I couldn't be the man, I couldn't be the protector for my little one. And I couldn't be the protector for Leo. But when I was at the top of, you know, when you cross over that border in Scotland, I was just like, yeah, but what did we do on the recovery? What did we do to to the recovery side of it? And that's the great thing. I think that's where, you know, on any of these things, you're saying about that piece of of uh, of that breathing point. It's when your your brain clicks in and goes, Hey, we've got over that and we've done it in the right way and we are now in a place where we can learn from it instead of being in that kind of place where we're, we're going Christ Almighty um, that's 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 the battle scar the battle scars there it's where where do we go forward or oh, Georgie that's how I felt on uh, you know but I had to re-emasculate myself in some ways I had to do something that was kind of physically like hey I, I want to go and cycle from one end to the other end of England because I've got to prove that I'm a man again and the end of it I was just like well who gives a who gives a beep it was more I had to clear something and change it that's really interesting isn't it it's really interesting what that that's like another driver it's a thing that's driving you to 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 you know do a particular thing and this this theme of metamorphosis is quite interesting george i think where you're concerned especially because they talk a lot about you when you read an article about bamford watch department they you know a lot of people will say rebel you know now collaborator and i guess leonora's perspective on this would be really interesting as well because your metamorphosis in terms of that sort of person of wanting to be a disruptor, wanting to change things up, wanting to take a great watch and do something different with it so that it was something different and it was individual and it was personalised, you know. And then now you're working with all of these people and you're at the table and you're having those conversations um, as an equal. You know, how's that sort of gone? So I'm out of, uh, I'm out of the shade and I'm into the sun. Um, and that's how I describe it to everyone. Um, you know, before I was I was doing stuff as the, you know, as, as you said, rebel. Um, I, 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 I it was more because I was just like, hey, I want to do something. And now going into where working with the brands, I, it's so damn cool. You know, I've, I've got a watch that we're launching in Japan. I'm just kind of pinching myself going, what, we're, we're launching it around a Formula One. We're doing this. We're doing that. Is this really happening? So, you know, where before I would have uh, kind of crazy ideas, but it never come to fruition. Now I'm like, you know, I, I have this crazy idea and the, and the brand goes, oh, yeah, let's do it. You know, Chopard with the Desert Racer. They were just like, yeah, go on, go, go to Mexico, go and race in Mexico. It was like, really? OK, let's do it. And so I think that's kind of... Um, that reality, my metamorphosis, um, it was, I'm sure, darling, you were in those head scratching days uh, six years ago or seven years ago where I made the decision to jump over to um, to working with the brands was probably the hardest year. It was like almost me going off from photography 
to uh, to watch business it was one of those things where you know sacrificing the punk side and the uh, the money that came with that to something that was unknown um but looking back for me i feel like it's been an absolutely amazing uh, journey darling what do you think yeah no i agree it it was a change but not not really a huge one because i think you still do disrupt things you go into the brands and you do something that they might not you know a little bit on edge they might not feel so comfortable about but you're always so enthusiastic and it always works out in the end i mean our eldest well it often works out in the end (laughs) sometimes Um, Sometimes. but the, the brands are always happy in the end you know and it's funny because when we're sitting but I, I mean, he's. You've often got a launch, haven't you, darling? And we were sitting on holiday, and he's literally on edge. And if this thing doesn't sell out within like thirty-eight seconds, for George, that's a massive failure. So he's always waiting, waiting. And they all wait. Touch wood. They no. They do. Yeah, they sell out, and it gets but quick. Ne- and... I never believe. I never believe because it's it's other people loving what we do or not loving what you do. But they do. It's like the people listening I'm, to this and watching this. It's, I'm sure. It's, uh, I'm sure Land Rover are going to love love this part <laughs> with your T-shirt. Yeah, but again, disrupting. <laughs> yes. well, Isn't that brilliant? Exactly. But that's a Land Rover watch. Oh, there you go. It's a great watch. <laughs> so we did the watch with Land Rover. Um, and, you know, that was one of those things. So I, I worked with them creating their own Land Rover um, so I'm kind of advertising it, but it's, uh, it's good. actually it's um, but it's uh, it's a Land Rover watch. Oh, it's upside down. There you go. <laughs> but I, uh, I don't want to blow smoke up up <laughs> anywhere. But George is cool without thinking he's cool. You know, he, last night it was so sweet. We, I was looking on Dover Street Market with my son. We were just surfing and seeing he's majorly into Carhartt or whatever it's called. And there's a big collab coming up. And we were looking. He was like. He's like, this is so cool. This store's so cool. He loves to shop in London. He's like, Daddy stocks here, right? And I was like, Yep, Daddy stocked there right from the beginning. And it's very sweet seeing like that age of teens coming into like what's cool and the streetwear and the thing. And they all look at George and they're like, Oh my God, he's so cool. So I think that's quite a nice um, thing. I know you don't really know that, but I think it's quite it's okay. nice. It's sweet for the next generation to come on and sort of. Look up to you. You just need to keep cool, baby. <laughs> George, another thing, another thing you don't know, and neither do you, Leo, is that when Ben and I first got together, he called me Olive and I called him Popeye. And would you believe, Ben, that George Sweet. actually has a Popeye watch? That he yeah, does. Sh- you I, need one I, of those. I, sh- I should have it here. I've even you've got, got a, you've got, I've got something full next size. Door. I've got full size Popeyes, and I, 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 I love Popeye. I love Snoopy and Popeye. Uh, I've only got have I got I've, no I've only got Snoopies with me today so I've got I've, I, you know when you're saying about decluttering your your kitchen um, I could never say that to my children because my office is full <laughs> I've got Simpsons behind me I've got old garbage patch kids I've got things that make me smile in my office so it's kind of so yeah I, Popeye. I can't believe that you you're called Popeye and Olive. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for He's sharing that. Me. Thanks He's for sharing that with everyone, Georgie. <laughs> He's gonna hate me. Sorry, every that. everyone everyone send him Popeye things. Yeah, you need on that social. <laughs> that would like be our, amazing. No, the the amount thing, of hashtags Popeye. The worst thing is our son no, is let's called. Ch- Fox. Let's change the subject. Yeah, our son Sweet. is called oh. Fox, but this is just as bad. So our son Fox, every single present, very grateful. Thank you so much, everyone, when he was born. Um, obviously contained something to do with a fox. So like fox jumpsuits, fox this, fox that. Fox. We have got awesome. so many foxes that we don't know what to do with. So yeah, we'll be decluttering those soon too. <laughs> no, don't declutter. It's kind of like... Madness okay, so George, I've got to ask you, you both of you actually, as people that are sort of, um, you know, on the cutting edge of trends and what's happening next, what's the next big trend, George? What's the next big thing that's going to happen in the world of, I don't know, fashion or whatever it might be that, that people like you will be jumping all over? So I'm, I'm playing with AI a lot at the moment. Um, I'm using it as my creative um, 
uh, what was I? Uh, creative tool, uh, Swiss Army knife. Um, it's making me into an artist. Um, I'm using a Mid Journey um, AI software. I, I learned. Uh, I was taught myself la uh, last summer um, that uh, to Leo's detriment um, because I was on holiday and I was playing with with something on my phone. So that was a great um, great thing. But what was interesting? So I, I say about fail fast. I learned it because I wanted to figure out is this a helpful tool for me and i think to myself is we all say ai is going to be part of the future but i look at it and i i'm reducing down my time on um giving my creative team the actual what i'm what i'm envisaging envisaging um because sometimes my words don't uh, because of my dyslexia sometimes my words don't actually articulate it in the right way and this gives me the way to actually present to them here's an image um this is what i'm thinking about i see that i think we're going to see a lot more um people becoming uh, or reducing down of time and making making it more productive i would also say is there is a lot of pushback you know i said this to i was in geneva yesterday and and there's a lot of pushback from people saying oh we you know we wouldn't do it this is i think to myself is you have to look at embracing what's around you and and doing something that's a little bit different and learning if you're going to do it or not going to do it but you have to understand it before saying no so i think that's where i'm I, you're asking me what what the trends are i i'm of course i'm worried about christmas i'm worried about next year because i that's that's me being a warrior and worrying you know about mortgage rates and all those things and will people buy and and you know will there be a uh, shrinking of that market um, that's my fear, but the other side is, I think, creativity. I think we're going to see a jump. Oh, in our world, I mean, there's such, of course, technology is right at the forefront of it. You know, think 3D printing and yeah, AI, HMI development and computer simulation tools. Uh, you know, the, we're always looking for the for the next step forwards on in, in those areas. It makes such that, a big difference. It's, it's that one percent change, isn't it, or one percent gain that is. Uh, I remember reading that book uh, about the percentage change. And marginal gains. Marginal gains. Marginal that, gains. That, chap yeah. called Dave and Brailsford, who works yes. with us with, uh, with the different sports teams. Yeah, that, that's and, definitely yeah, an approach. And But also in our game in the America's Cup, we're, we're also looking for some of the big ticket items if we can find those as well. And then you're really, you're really you know, onto a winner. Guys, what I'd like to do is ask you both for a performance hack, if that's okay, just before we go, which is um, uh, something that people can do better every single day to improve their performance in whatever it might be, work, life, home, all of it. Leo, what do you, what do you want to go first? Um, I guess I've got a trio. Um, number one, and we haven't touched on it in a huge way, is exercise. Something George does every day and it makes him better in every way. When he exercises, his mind's clear. If he's got a cold or flu and he can't um, for any reason, it puts you down in the dumps, doesn't it? And I think anyone... I mean... I mean you can even do, you know, I put with that even yoga, meditation, breathing. We can all breathe better. You know, I'm a shallow breather and I think that is a huge thing. So exercise more, I would say, and sleep. And I know it's so boring, but if you can sleep better, everyone needs a different amount. But I always, if I've had a good night's sleep, I wake up ready for action. And then I guess the last one is motivation. Find out what motivates you. And do it, and do it every day. Get motivated, and I think that helps in all areas, whether it's for you, your children, your family. And I would say a happy, happy mama is a happy home. <laughs> I, I feel really bad by saying any of this because you've got Mr. Performance Ben here. That's kind of like I'm just like, oh yes, my performance hack is this. <laughs> he can um, always learn. He my... can always learn. <laughs> No, do you know, for me, um, whatever the day, I, I, I normally do fitness at the end of the day, unless I'm in Japan or Asia or wherever else I am where the time zones are off. Uh, and then it's first thing in the morning. But I always love um, either running, cycling or whatever it is um, and leaving whatever crap that has happened on the pavement behind me. 
on the you know I've got happy runs uh, there was a there's a run in Hong Kong and there's a there's runs everywhere that I've been that I I I think you you drop these you you leave whatever has been bad behind you and you carry on running and that's the most beautiful thing of of like you reset whatever because you're leaving the pain on the pavement and that's my kind of my thing of like you leave it on the bike you leave it on the and then you come back and you're like hey i can reset so it's not for fitness benefits you know i i always say to people uh, there was a, a friend of mine and he was going through quite a hard divorce and I took him for a jog and I said come on and I think we did a mile and now he's doing seven or eight miles and he's like and he keeps on messaging me and hey you know I've done this and I've run here and I've, and it's not it's not that he's doing those miles he said I just feel like I'm I'm dropping my the baggage of life so that I can go forward and that that for me is probably the performance hack uh, I know this is probably meant to be a very short kind of answer, but that's my kind of uh, my long winded way of saying go for a run or go and go for a walk, go, for, go and do something. No, it's, it's brilliant. And it, it's very rare that you regret going for a run, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. There was a few times where I was fearing going for a run. I, I mean, I, one of them was on holiday and it was boiling hot. And I was like, the hell are you doing, George? Why, you know, we could go and have a drink and go and have, you know, a nice food, but you know, it's just like we go for a run. Uh, you always feel better for it after. <laughs> a quick question that I just wanted to ask you both, because you both travel a lot, jet lag. How do you overcome, George, your whole business is about time and time travel. How do you overcome the issue of jet lag? I run. My, my thing is get up, go for a run. Uh, it is my, I, I go, I, like I, I was in Singapore and I joined the Singapore Running Club. I was there for uh, 24 hours and I was just like, guys, hey, I, I, you know, so wherever it is, wherever you are, either go, go and explore the city because the thing is, if you're stuck in a hotel, you come from a, you know, airport to a taxi to a hotel, you, you're basically in crap air wherever you are. So go and go out and go and enjoy whatever the city is, you know, that or wherever you are, go and run because then at least you, your lungs are being filled with something different. It's a top tip. Thank you, both of you. Guys, so nice to speak to you. Yeah, yeah you so, too. Lo Take lo care, lovely to meet you. you. Look, I, I think that was a, a wonderful opportunity to spend some time with a, a delightful couple of both extremely driven in their own spheres with their own businesses, their own startups. George was very open about his privileged background, but also that he wanted to go out on his own, stand on his own two feet and build his own business. And you can see the drive and determination in that and, and with Beanora. So yeah, I, I was, I thought it was, uh, it, they were both really impressive. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think also they're so open about the struggles that they've faced. They talk about neurodiversity being a problem for both of them. Plenty of people can relate to that. You know, where school can be a bit of a struggle, but actually how else do you sort of, um, you know, find the thing that drives you? Where do you get that from? You know, is it from sport? Is it from creativity? You know, and really honing in on that. And also the other piece that like, not just resource um, and talent, it is going to lead to success. You have got to be driven. You've got to be motivated. You've got to be a self-starter. And without actually the hard work ethic, but none of it, the rest of it will happen. Um, we know that. We, you know that is something that is is repeated um, through various entrepreneurial people again and again. But it is good to hear it in various different contexts, and it's good to hear it from those two. Uh, thank you for watching and or listening. This has been Performance People. We are Ben and George Ainsley. And remember, from what we've learned today, actually above all else, go for a run. Do some exercise, do the do. Um, that's certainly the Bamford way. <laughs>